All right, thanks for tuning in for part two here. Let's take a look at benefits of biodiversity. Conserving biodiversity preserves ecosystem services, also called environmental services, and directly provides things of pragmatic or practical value to us and to other species as well. We use living organisms for food, fuel, living organisms or their byproducts as food, fuel, and fiber, like cotton, for example. We use it for shelter and building materials, like wood from trees. Air and water purification, this is done by many plants and microorganisms. Waste decomposition, definitely by microorganisms. Um, climate stabilization and moderation, part of the carbon cycle, for example. Nutrient cycling, we talked about specialized bacteria doing nitrogen fixation, nitrification, denitrification, which enhances soil fertility. We know that bees do a lot of pollination for us. Um, various insects help control other insects that destroy food crops, etc. Let's take a look at one particular kind of ecosystem function, or one benefit, is allowing healthier ecosystems. High levels of biodiversity increase the stability of communities and ecosystems. By stability, we mean it's less susceptible to disturbances. For example, if you were, a, if you were to introduce a non-native species, if it's, a bear, if it's a very stable ecosystem, then there won't be many available niches for that non-native um, species, and so it likely will not become invasive. Resilience of ecological systems, meaning their ability to weather disturbances or stress or adapt to change, that is also increased by high levels of biodiversity. So if there is a disturbance, a healthy ecosystem with high biodiversity can more quickly bounce back. Will losing one species really matter? Well, if it's a keystone species, then yes. You remove a keystone species like a sea otter from a system, and the system changes drastically. Top predators like tigers are often keystone species, and top predators are often the most endangered types of organisms. They are few in number to begin with. They're case strategists, so they have few offspring, and they must care for those offspring for them to survive. And they're usually large, conspicuous, easy to hunt. Another benefit of biodiversity is food security. Here's a table of some foods that we don't commonly eat now, but we might in the future, like amaranth. It's a grain which I've actually eaten, and it's really good. It grows in tropical and Andean areas. Um, it's a grain. You have maca, which is a root vegetable. Uh, I've had maca powder. It has some medicinal um, values to it. And um, other animals here that we might end up hunting and eating for our food in the future. as climate change occurs, we may be relying on some of these. And I um, want to mention here about genetic diversity within crop species and their relatives. This enhances our agriculture and provides insurance against losses of prevalent strains of staple crops. In this country, we grow a lot of corn, a lot of wheat, um, and those are our, two of our biggest crops. And we grow a relatively few number of strains of those crops. So we would like to have high biodiversity, high numbers of different types of those crops, so that if one strain becomes susceptible to a virus, perhaps the other strain of the same species may have a resistance to it, and we can rely on that. Medicine is also an important benefit of biodiversity. Take a look at all these drugs. They all come from a plant. This drug comes from pineapple. It can control inflammation. And um, this drug, Taxol, comes from the Pacific U. It's an anti-cancer, especially anti-ovarian cancer. So we want to make sure that because many of these species provide novel medicines, we don't want to drive these extinct without ever discovering their uses, because all these may be a potential cure for AIDS or cancer or other ailments. Another benefit is economic benefits. Here you see a couple on a, an eco-tour in a Costa Rican rainforest. And for all nations, ecotourism can be a major contributor to the economy, especially for developing nations rich in biodiversity. People pay good money, um, affluent tourists especially, would pay good money to see wildlife, novel natural communities, and protected ecosystems. And it's nice because the, um, the nations that are offering this are actually protecting the environment, protecting these resources, as opposed to exploiting them for, um, for commercial value. Biophilia, a term meaning human love for and attachment to other living things, or the connections that human beings subconsciously seek out with the rest of life. 
we do this in a lot of ways. We generally like going to parks and getting to see wildlife. We go to zoos. We keep pets. We value real estate with landscape views. We have an interest in escaping cities to go hiking, birding, fishing, hunting, backpacking, etc. These things are all enhanced by having high biodiversity. And there's a man, a famous biologist named Edward O. Wilson, who has become the best known spokesperson for biodiversity. He's an accomplished scientist and writer, and he has raised awareness of threats to Earth's life and of impending species ex extinctions. So what about ethics? Do we have an ethical responsibility to prevent species extinction? On one hand, as humans, we need to use resources and consume other organisms to survive. This is just how life works. But on the other hand, we have conscious reasoning ability and are able to make conscious decisions. Are we make decisions? Are we making decisions that are best for other species? Or we, are we being over exploitative or over exploitive? And are we actually putting ourselves at risk by some of these decisions because we're not managing these resources, biodiversity being a resource, carefully? So this blends us into a field called conservation biology, and we'll take a look at this in part C.